The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next speaker is Catherine Ogenbach from uh, University of Texas, and she is going to talk about quantification of fly ash composition and its reactivity. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess it's rolled over into afternoon now, so thank you for being here. I know it's lunchtime. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Katie Ockenbach, and I'm a PhD candidate at UT Austin. Uh, Dr. Maria Younger is my advisor, and I'm also working with Paul Stutzman at NIST on this work, which is using a relatively new method, scanning electron microscopy coupled with multispectral image analysis to analyze the glassy phase composition as well as the reactivity of these glassy phases for fly ashes that we might want to use in geopolymers. So just quick background on fly ash. You've got anywhere from 10 to 40 percent uh, crystalline material, and that's pretty easy to measure. You just do x-ray diffraction, do a Rietveld analysis, and you can come up with what you have and how much. But glassy phases are more difficult to characterize. They're very disordered in nature. They kind of can be an everything but the kitchen sink kind of composition, lots of variability. Um, and then many compositions of glass exist in a single fly ash from particle to particle, but you can even see this within a single particle differences in composition. So what we're trying to do is use this x-ray mapping method um, to determine what the glassy phases actually are. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the method as well as give you an example of my work um, since it's a very non-standard um, method and the work has also really involved a lot of um, advancement of this method. So I actually am using a field emission scanning electron microscope and a dual EDS detector. The dual EDS detector is wonderful. If you try to do this work, you get very high counts, 60 to 80,000 counts per second. Uh, so it expedites the collect data collection process. Um, and we're working at 10 kV accelerating voltage. The maps themselves are 1024 by 768. And then with the dwell time we're using of 256, um, it's about six minutes to collect each map. Um, so the whole experiment takes about 24 minutes. But again, this is partially because we have this dual EDS system. It's wonderful. Can't say enough good things. Um, and then this last point is actually really important um, when I get to showing you my data. Um, we did some work in, and ensured that the pixel values at each location for each x-ray map represent the actual counts at that location for the individual um, elements that we're measuring. So although it's not a stoichiometric representation of composition, you can have kind of a, a ratio of the amounts of silicon to aluminum that are based on a more real value. Um, the reason that this is important is sometimes the programs will rescale your data as, the, as they save it. So you want to make sure that you're working off of a real basis. So the data are representative of the actual count values. Um, in order to process the data, I have to do a little bit of post-processing. Sometimes a median filter is necessary, sometimes it's not necessary. It just kind of depends on how much noise and how well resolved the particles are. Um, and I'm also thresholding the uh, images to remove low-end noise. And if you've seen me uh, present before, I've actually changed the way that I do this. I'm using um, MATLAB now to kind of do a find and replace filter. So any values below a particular value that I considered noise are then replaced with zero. And then this is done in a program called ImageJ. The multispectral image analysis is completed in a program called Multispec. So that's one reason that, um, that the noise needs to be removed accurately is because you're going from one program to the other. 
Um, so in multi-spec, I can virtually stack as many images as I want. So I'm actually only stacking about seven different element maps. Um, but then it allows you to analyze composition through that stack of seven maps and get an idea of the total composition of your material. So this is what an image stack looks like. And I do want to note, I, I didn't say this previously, but these are epoxy mounted and flat polished specimens. So it's, um, you know, the black background is just a carbon epoxy. Uh, but all of the particles you can see very clearly. In this case, we have silicon in green, aluminum in red, and calcium in blue. And you see these very bright uh, particles, uh, bright green particles that are uh, quartz particles. You can tell that not only through using EDS spot analysis, but also the angularity and the strong silicon signal. Um, but then the rest of it's sort of a jumble of a lot of different, almost like a continuum of colors that you can see that represent the various um, glassy phases. So, of course, this is one challenge in, in analyzing the data is drawing those distinctions between the phases. So in order to determine, um, in order to determine the glassy phases and how much, I look at the different maps turning on and off different elements and then I select these training classes. So you can see on the left, there are boxes drawn around various groups of pixels, and these are the phases that I have defined in my specimen. Um, the one that's easiest to forget about is the voids. So if you ever do this, make sure that you have defined the voids, because otherwise it's trying to put all these carbon-rich pixels into an aluminosilicate phase and screws everything up. And then on the right is the resulting uh, image that you get after the pixels have been assigned. So on the left is actual data. That's the actual image stack of the x-ray maps. On the right is each of the pixels has now been assigned to a particular phase, and so you can more clearly see how those phases are distributed around the fly ash. Um, and then I'm also uh, I'm applying this to raw material fly ash, and then I'm also doing a dissolution method. So the idea is you want to know how the glasses are reacting. So I want to know um, over time and after exposure to a solution. So two of the most common uh, dissolution methods that you see in the literature, one is hydrofluoric acid. I think that's the one I see the most often, but that's getting at reactive silica. And one downside to this method is that it's an acid dissolution, and it's not representative of the caustic environments that you're seeing uh, when you're doing an actual geopolymer mix. So I've also seen other others and myself are using sodium hydroxide uh, dissolution method. Um, and that gets more at the reactive material, not just the reactive silica that's present. And then this is just a picture to show you how, how it looks. Um, but I'm using 8 molar sodium hydroxide. Uh, for, so for the results that I show you, it's 8 molar sodium hydroxide um, leachant solution and to, at 10, 10 milliliters, and then two grams of the fly ash. So it's a very dilute mixture, and it's continuously agitated, so I'm not allowing it to set. So again, once you see the treated fly ashes, it's, it's a powder sample that I've epoxy mounted, so it's not a paste. So the fly ash that I'm going to show you the results for is an, it's called Atacocan fly ash. It's a class F. It's from Oregon. Um, I was struck in the previous presentation that the calcium oxide was 14%, but it was a class C fly ash. This is 12%, so almost as much calcium, but it's a class F fly ash. Um, and I, for, for the fly ashes I'm working on, that's sort of moderate. Um, I'm looking at 10 different fly ashes, and two of them have, you know, in the 20%, whereas this one, is coupled with about four of them, and then I have a few that are really, really low calcium. Um, and then it's kind of a, a low amount of iron oxide um, in this in this fly ash as well. So nothing nothing really crazy about this one. Um, I've I've done Rietveld analysis on all of them, but just in the interest of time, I'll show you this bulk amorphous content for all 10 fly ashes, and the atacocan is circled in the middle. It has the highest bulk amorphous content, um, but all of them, again, they're you know up in the, the range of 70 to 80 percent, with the exception of the Fontana, which was pretty low. So these are the results that I got for that fly, for the atacocan fly ash, and this is the phase assignment map. The phases that I'll describe for this one are over here, the phase designations. And I want to make clear that the 
the names that I give them are not necessarily indicative of any stoichiometry or actual composition. They're just kind of relative to each other. Um, so what I saw in this material. Um, so I have a phase aluminosilicate, I have phase CAS, and the CAS1 low aluminum. Um, and as you can see, the CAS phase had a relatively low amount of, of calcium. The C to S ratio is only 0 0.2, and the S to A ratio is, is somewhat low, so it has more aluminum than silicon. Um, whereas the CAS1 has m much more silicon than aluminum at 1.28, um, and about the same uh, uh, calcium to silicon. So, but again, these are intensity ratios based on the count values um, that were obtained in EDS. So, just to give you an idea of, of area percentages about how much we had, there was about half of it was the CAS phase. This was the one that was moderately uh, low calcium. Um, and then, but it still contained calcium as opposed to the aluminosilicate, about 25% of that. Um, which had no calcium present, um, and then 12% of this low AL CAS phase. And then, of course, the iron rich was just a tiny little sliver, and then the quartz was about 13%. So, this is contrasted with the, the raw material, is contrasted with the material after exposure to the solution for 28 days. And as I said, this is a powder sample that was mounted in epoxy, so this is not a paste. Um, but you can see that we now have these two reaction products present, um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about what those actually are. So we still have small amounts of the aluminosilicate um, and the CAS present. However, the CAS1 was not identified in the reacted specimen. Um, instead, the CAS2 phase was reacted. But what's interesting is the CAS is this kind of salmon pink, so for example, this particle, um, but it's surrounded by not just one, but two layers of reaction product. And this reaction product two that forms the inner layer is actually a higher silicon um, reaction product, and it also has a pretty large amount of calcium compared to the other reaction product. So it, it seems that the CAS1 has been leached of silicon and calcium to form this reaction product. And then the reaction product 2 is actually um, forming mostly around the low calcium, and it's a, it had a higher amount of um, aluminum in, in, ten, in terms of intensity ratio. It had a higher aluminum, but it's mostly aluminosilicate material with a very low amount of calcium. So in terms of how much, I will skip over this because it's easier to look at this way. Um, you see that we had about 75% reaction product in the reacted specimen. Um, and then we had that CAS low AL phase that disappeared entirely, um, but then also the high aluminum one that appeared at about 5% after 28, excuse me, 28 days. Um, and then just still have kind of small amounts of the CAS and the aluminosilicate remaining in the sample. So in summary, the fly ash had an aluminosilicate, two CASs, an iron-rich phase, and then I didn't present the XRD, but it contained molite and quartz. Um, all of the glassy phases appeared reactive in this. And I'm only showing you the one, uh, the one data set, but some of the fly ashes actually didn't have any reaction product that showed up. Um, over time. So it's this one, um, all of the glassy phases reacting is, is significant. Um, and then we had two types of reaction product, and the high CA reaction product, reaction product two, uh, seemed to have formed from the CAS1 particles by leaching. So this method allows for a qualitative and quantitative or semi quantitative analysis of the glassy phases that are present, and it's interesting to look over time and see what's happening. Um, I'm working on analyzing the reactivity for 10 different fly ashes, 2 class C, 8 class F, and um, I also am collecting data at 7 days and 28 days, so we'll see kind of the progression of how they change over those time periods. So um, I'd like to thank CMMI for the funding and also Asia Beg, who was an undergraduate who helped me um, complete the research. So, oh, and NIST, of course, because I got to go use their SEM, which is really awesome. Uh, any questions? Bill Sackrice, uh, St. Mary's, you know, 
Um, I'm whether it would be interesting for you to come and work with uh, analyzing the solution afterwards. Yes, and that was done in previous work, um, but in the interest of time and all of the fly ashes that I'm analyzing, we were just looking at the solids this time. Thank you. Um, I do. I have been doing X-ray diffraction on the reactive material also, um, and then I, as kind of a preliminary indication of reactivity of the fly ashes, I made mortar cubes to sort of get an idea of their reactivity um, compared to each other. So it's it's an interesting comparison, but I didn't. I'll put just this part in. Um, well, let me go back. I'll show you the, uh, um, this Blues Creek fly ash um, only had one weight percent of calcium, and research work has shown that, um, that the calcium has some effect on the reactivity. I think it's due to disorder, increased disorder in the glassy phases, um, and so this one actually showed almost nothing. It also had a really high amount of molite, um, as did the Fontana. So that's, that's something that's interesting because you see, you would expect the Fontana to do terribly and then the Blues Creek might do well because it had almost 70 weight percent of amorphous, but the Martin Lake did awesome, but the Blues Creek did terribly. So that's why it takes all these different methods to really get an understanding of, of what's happening. And the goal is to, I'm not trying to independently determine glassy phases in each of the different fly ashes. I really, I'm trying to identify similarities um, across the different fly ashes and, and have kind of the same, see if the same glassy phases are present in the different fly ashes and if that's something that you can identify if you want to use a fly ash um, for geopolymer or, I mean, I think this applies also for um, OPC blends, so I haven't done that work, but <laughs> it, should, it should also be useful there. Um, actually, four of them are from Pacific Northwest, one of them's from North Carolina, and I think the rest are from Texas. Thank you, Katie. Thank you.